Thank you. Hey, good morning, good morning, or, yeah, we're still morning. You got five minutes. So it's good morning, everyone who slept in and enjoyed your, your day to, uh, to actually catch up on your hour of sleep. Uh, well done. My name is Ben Miller, lead pastor here at Ben Christian Fellowship, and I'm so grateful that you came to church today. This is a great day to be at church. It's cold outside, and it's nice and warm inside, so that's where we have to, to hide. Have you ever prayed and asked the Lord like that he would uh, do something and you feel like he never answers your prayer? For years, I've been asking, Lord, can March be spring in Bend? Like, like, could we just please, please let it be the month of spring? And I think there's something in me that continually wants that. Like, like you see it coming yesterday. We're all like in, in short, short sleeves and enjoying it. Like, spring is here. The Lord's answered my prayer. And then you wake up this morning and see the snow on the deck, and you're thinking, Lord, you're not answering my prayer anymore. What happened here? So, uh, but there's, there's something in your heart and spirit that needs to make sure you set your trajectory farther. I told Rachel, I'm still going to pray and hope for another two to three feet of snow in March, <clears throat> not because I want it, just because I need to like, I need to make sure that mentally I'm ready for it when it comes. And, uh, and then in April, we can all start to be excited about the good weather that's coming. So I love Bend. I love how temperamental it is and um, <clears throat> the ups and the downs and just in the absolute shock season. So welcome to Bend, especially if you're new here. You're going to love it. It's awesome. And uh, it, will, it will change. But I love the snow, and uh, I'm happy to be here, happy to be in church this morning. I grew up in the church, so uh, I, I appreciate that. I love the fact that I have a history <clears throat> and that I, I grew up in the church. And as I grew up in the church, I learned different Bible stories. And uh, I learned all, and I'm sure you did as well. We're getting ready to walk into a brand new series here called The Big Picture. And the idea behind this one is that, is that I'm willing to admit <clears throat> that we spend 95% of our communication at church in our life groups zoomed in. Like we, we look at the Bible all the time with this microscope and we're looking at individual stories. And, uh, and as we do that, it's, it, it's only probably 5% that we step back, we look at the Bible from the big picture and can see it for what it really is. And, uh, and so growing up, I had the same story. I looked at it, and, and as, I, as, I, as I, I grew up in the church, I could tell you every Bible story, every character. I knew about Jonah and the big whale. I knew about David and Goliath and exactly where he hit him with the rock. I knew that Jesus was the main, the main character. Uh, I heard about Moses and Joseph and all of these different people in the Bible. You heard their individual stories. And uh, I actually even knew, like, the book, my guess was was that it started really well because we talk about all the good things, and then uh, I know we're all still mad at Adam and Eve for what they did, and so and then it got really really bad. There was this main character Jesus that came, and then I do know that the last book is like you start to read it and you're thinking, oh, it's a you know it's a it's a doozy that book, and um, <clears throat> and it's all about God's return and the, the the sequel and everything. You look at it, man, this is just this like I had ideas and I knew about individual stories, uh, but I can tell you I. I do remember the day that I stepped back and I, instead of seeing them in, as individuals, I was able to look at it and, and see it for what it was. And that was the day for me that it all clicked. Like that the story of the Bible all could, all could be seen in the big picture. And I mean, maybe you've been coming to church for a year <clears throat> or maybe you've been going to church for a lifetime and you, may, you might say, I have never been in a, in a teaching or a service where all of a sudden they showed me the big picture. But we actually need to see the big picture. And I know the day that it went from individual stories to actually seeing the story of the Bible for me, that's when it clicked. And that's when I think that my, even my faith found an anchor to be able to say, wow, it's not, just, it's not just all this happenstance. It's not just all individual lives, but there's actually a story that's being told through the Bible. The Bible is core. It's foundation to everything that we teach. If you've, if you've noticed, every single week we teach from the same book. And I understand other people are like, there's other books out there. You know, there are other books, but, but this is like our core book. This is our key book, and thank God there's at least 1,200 pages in it because could you imagine if it was a short read and we talked about it every week? Like, like there's enough in there to keep interest. I get that, and, um, but it is, it is core to who we are, and you, I mean, maybe if you say, hey, I, I got saved, I gave my heart to Jesus, and, and someone handed you a Bible, or maybe someone gave you a Bible, or you went through growth track and you got a Bible. Um, it is core to everything we are. You know, it's like, hey, by the way, you need to read this. Your whole life now hinges around this. This is the foundation of all that you know. Every question that we have, everything that we hold on to, we find an answer in here. And, and I can say this from a church perspective. We're 33 years old as a church, and for every single Sunday, we have used this book and have quoted these scriptures. 
Like, this has been core to everything we are for years and years and years. And I know that there was a, a moment when we transitioned uh, from my, my dad to even myself four and a half years ago where my dad was like, are you going to use the scripture? Like, you've got to use the scripture every week. And um, some would say that my dad maybe overused the scripture, but, but he's happy with that, and I'm happy with that. He says, if you're going to be mad at me for one thing, let it be that I, I use too much scripture in a message, not enough. And um, there was, you know, definitely the first time where I would, just for fun for my dad, I'd go almost the whole message before I mentioned a scripture just to see if we could get his blood boiling, you know, like, like to see where he's at. He's like, this is it, like, this is it. And, uh, and then we'd pull out a scripture. So we did hold that line, and we still talk about the Bible. And it's actually, it, it almost concerns me sometimes when I talk to somebody who said, I, I've been at a church, or I was at a place where, where I, 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 never, I never heard a scripture mentioned. We talked about the Bible, but we actually never mentioned it. We never read it. We never used it as our core foundation. We as a church, this is central to everything that we do and believe and talk about. All of our life groups, everything is central to this. I want to tell you why. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. This is absolutely beautiful. And it says this. This is John writing. He said, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. What's beautiful about this scripture in John 1 is it's actually mirroring. So this is the beginning of the New Testament. It's actually mirroring the beginning of the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 1 says this, the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered over the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God said, these are the words of God. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. In fact, he said, let there be matter and let there be earth and let there be space and let there be vegetation and let there be animals. And then he said, let there be humankind. And what we see when we read Genesis chapter 1 is a reminder that everything that you see and experience, everything that you can touch and everything that's tangible on this planet earth was actually formed from the words of God. That is what brings life. That's why in 1 John 4, he says this, the word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. And still today, we believe that his words, in, the, in scripture, his words are what bring life to your soul. It's what brings light to your home and to, our, to, this, to his church and to our community. We believe wholeheartedly that the, the energy or the creation and of life comes through his words. His words in creation, but then also his words in the Bible. There's something amazing about, about even this book. When I pick it up and I start to read it, there's something that actually activates life inside of me. It actually becomes like a, a light in the middle of darkness. When I don't know what to do, I have no clue what my next step is, I can actually read anything in here. And it says his light will start, it'll start to bring light, and it'll start to bring life. And I've done it before where, like, you're totally lost, and you just go to a random scripture, and you're thinking, this isn't even the answer for what I'm asking. But his word, and his words, from creation to even today, are alive. They're active, and they bring light, and they bring life to each and every one of us. This is why it's so key to everything that we teach and everything that we believe. There is a power in his words. And there's a power to create and to bring life into you, into everything that you see and everything that you, you hold on to. And so there's a beauty in his word. And we celebrate that today. And for us, that is core to who we are. And we don't want to just know about like, like individual words. We actually want to know about the word. And I remember the day it clicked for me. When I didn't just go from individual, I went from individual stories to like actually seeing his story. Something in me just anchored my spirit, anchored my, my faith. I said, there's no way I could ever unbelieve what I believe. There's a beauty in it. Now this uh, series, we're doing a four-part series. Uh, today's the first one, and I want to answer the question today about the storyline and who's who at the party, and, and we kind of want to look at, look at it. Next week, what we're going to end up doing is talking about historical timeline and how everything fits in, what's the difference between a timeline versus content, and how's it all come together. I know everybody's thinking, like, this is going to be so boring. It's okay. It's a teaching series, so it's going to be great. You will love it. Third week, what we're going to do is we're actually going to bring in a friend of mine, Travis Arnold. 
who was a professor at Portland Bible College. This is where I, I studied. And uh, I asked him to come in. We thought it would be amazing to bring a teacher in the middle of a teaching series. Part of the reason, so you guys can actually see what a teacher looks like and, and how they speak. <laughs> how they speak. I know. Uh, Don is so sweet to me. He keeps saying, Ben, you're, you're such a great teacher. And I'm thinking, yeah, but let's wait till we get a real one here. Just so you can, you know, you can see it based off of that. And, uh, and so Travis is going to come in, and I've asked him, Travis, would you, I, I want this. As I leave that, that message, this is going to be on the 27th of this month. As I leave that Sunday, I want to know why, in the, why do we trust this one so much? How can we anchor everything to it? I want to know, how's it built and how's it come together? And so I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to Travis coming and, and bringing, uh, br- bringing even that content. And then the last one, which will be the first part of April, uh, I'm going to go back in and talk about rules of engagement. How do we interpret and what does it look like for us to actually be able to draw meaning out of the Bible? Instead of seeing it or taking meaning out of an individual piece or verse, we want to be able to look at it and say, how do we draw from it, what we learn. And so uh, this is going to be a teaching series, and uh, I can tell you this, it's, it, it's going to be a good series. This is stuff that builds faith, and, and we're going to try not to make it boring. So don't worry. You didn't, you, you, it's good that you slept in and didn't, still came to church. So it, it'll be worth it for you, I promise, and, and, you'll, and you'll like it. So I'm looking forward to it. I find that at least twice a year we want to do as a church a teaching series. That's something that, that pulls out, that zooms out, that gives us the context of what we believe so that as we learn individual stories, we have a place to put them, and we understand how they fit in. And so here we go today. I'm going to go through this t- the story timeline and who's who at the party. So the first part is this. Have you ever, um, have you ever sat and watched someone talk? No, please don't reference me because it would hurt my feelings. But have you, have you ever watched someone talk and you're thinking to yourself, you're like getting lost in their words and you're, wa- you're looking at their teeth and you can see their lips moving and you're thinking to yourself, like, could you please get to the point? Like, just do me, do me one favor. Just, just get to the point. That's what we need. We need you to get to the point because you're losing me very, very fast. And, um, or have you ever read an email? I'm the worst at this. So I'll open up an email, and, and you know, someone sent me an email, and you open it up, and you're like, scroll, scroll, scroll. And it's just this massive novel that they wrote for you to read. Now, the first thing I do is I look through it for any, like, bolds or highlights or underlined to say, like, is there going to be a point in me reading this? Like, is there a main point that you've highlighted for me? And, and, and then you don't see that, so you go back up to the title, and you realize you forgot to also put the main point in the title. And so now it's like I have to read a two-hour two two you know two hour novel just to see. And then sometimes when you do, you're like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to push through. And you read the whole two-hour novel, and at the end of it, you think to yourself, there was still no point in that. Why in the world did they do that? So I'm sorry if you're the person who emails me those long things. Um, I don't actually read them. I try. <laughs> I try so desperately hard. So if you could just bold like a sentence or maybe leave it in the title of what the the, the point is of that, that would be awesome. But like I'm the kind of person, I just want to know the point. I want to know like, okay, I'm here, I'm engaged, uh, I showed up, and, and, and and I want to know what is it that you're trying to tell me? What's the main point? that you're getting to. Here's, here's the beauty. In the Bible, there is one main point, and it's the storyline. It's the main theme. Here it is. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. This is the entire Bible. This is the story of the Bible. It's the story of creation. If you look at it, Genesis 1 and 2, which is the very first books, that tells you the story of creation. Then God said, and he spoke, and in fact, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, time, God created the heavens, space, and he created the earth, which is matter. It's a scientific sentence put into a beautiful form. And if we step back and we look at the t- first two, two uh, you know, chapters of the book, it is absolutely incredible how he lays out uh, every, everything and how, how it was created and how he spoke. And so we have to have energy in order to create something. Well, the energy was his voice, and we can see that his words alone created it. And there's this beauty in creation. And then by chapter 3, we hit fall. And for the next 818 pages of the book, that's what you get to read about. You get to read about what happens when sin comes into a perfect world. What happens when we choose to disobey and insert sin into this. Now, I I say 818 pages because I read this book, the Fresh Start Bible. This is the same book that, Bible, that if you go through Growth Track, we say, hey, if you don't have a Bible, please take this one. We have them on our shelf. If you don't own a Bible, or maybe you own a Bible that's like written in a different language, it seems like it's a different language, you should grab one of these. They're free. You should read it. You should grab it and consume it. This is absolutely an amazing book that will change your life. It'll bring light and life to everything that you do. So before you leave today, grab one. Grab one from the lobby. They cost nothing. Grab it and take it. But this is the story. And so we find is that, is that you have two chapters of the creation. You have 818 pages of the fall. So you're reading through, and maybe you've like, maybe you're in your Bible reading plan. Someone told me after, after first service, they're like, I'm in the book of Numbers. Really? Like, 
where am I at? Well, guess what? You're in the 1,818 you know, 1818 pages, 818 pages of like, hey, this is what happens when sin comes in. This is how gross it's going to get. This is what it's going to look like. And then there comes a moment in the New Testament, because the Bible's divided between old and new. And in the New Testament, you have a book, you have four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell the story of Jesus. Jesus is the redemption. Redemption means, I know maybe it's a churchy word, you've never heard of it, you don't know what it means. It means to save. It means we were, we were created perfect, sin destroyed everything, and Jesus came to actually save, to fix, to save all the sin, to save the sin and the shame and everything. And so why is it that when somebody first gives their heart to Jesus, you say, hey, start reading the book of John? Because it's really cool to start reading in the I got saved part as opposed to the what in the world for 1818, you know, 818 pages. Like, like, I'm missing the point, just keep reading. You know, three, three years later, you're like, there's got to be a point in here. The point is that sin can really mess up our lives and has messed up our lives. And most of this world lives in darkness. But you know what we need is we need redeemed. We need a savior. We can't do it on our own. This is the whole point of the Old Testament. We can never be good enough. We can never do enough. There's nothing that we can do that's going to actually save ourselves. It requires someone outside of us to save us. That's redemption. And then you find that there's a formation of the church, and you read through the last book of the, of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which is to come. And, uh, and it kind of can be a little bit crazy and weird, but I can tell you this. The last two chapters of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22, details for us what it looks like for final restoration. What is it going to look like when we go home and have a place in heaven with him? So the first two chapters are really good. The last two chapters are really good. And everything else in between it you got to realize that God has a plan. He has a story and something that he's talking about and something that he's leading us into. In fact, not only is this the story of the Bible, it is actually the story of every single story in the Bible. This is a cycle that continues to repeat over and over and over again. If you've ever heard the story of the life of Joseph, Joseph uh, was, a, was a young man that, that he, he, was, he was born, started growing up. He had this dream, this calling, where God placed a purpose and a calling on his life. He shares it with his dad, who's like, really? He shares it with his brothers, who were like, we hate you. And then what happens is his brothers are like, listen, you know good for nothing, little brat. And they, they decide, in order, in order to, to change it and get him out of their face, they decided to sell him into slavery. This is the fall portion of Joseph's life, and he spends the next 20 plus years of his life as a slave, and then he finally starts making his own way. Things are starting to go his way, and then he gets thrown by not his own will. He gets thrown into prison, and he now all of a sudden it's just like this is the effects of sin over and over and over until a moment. There's a moment where he gets redeemed, and God actually uses him, speaks to him to interpret a dream for a king, and that's the moment where he gets redeemed and set back in a place to actually, you know, to to oversee an entire kingdom through a famine. And then the most beautiful part of this story is the restoration, where his family, the ones that had sold him into slavery, had given him to a place of sin. He actually, they came before him, and he says the most amazing verse. He said, he said, my life, he said, everything that I've done was for the purpose of being able to restore my family. And he's, he actually restores the family, takes care of his family, and brings them, saves them for a moment. And it's so great to see the story of Joseph from creation to fall to redemption to a restoration of the family. David is a very, another, another famous person we would know of in the Bible, or maybe you haven't heard of him. But he was, he, at a young age, he used to tend sheep. And in fact, a prophet came to him, anointed him, and prayed over him and said, you will be the king of Israel. You'll be the king of God's people. And so he's like, this is awesome. He starts to operate in that. In fact, he's like, I'm going to step out and do this. And that's when he, he kills Goliath. And there's like this big moment where he's like, I'm doing it. It's awesome. This is working. And I know the story because I've heard it a hundred times. And then what's crazy about this story is not only did he kill Goliath and he starts, he starts like making it in life. Now all of a sudden the king who's there gets jealous. And this is the fall portion of David's life where he takes the next 20 years and he runs from Saul and he's, he's like trying to do everything he can. And at one point they're like, this guy is nuts. His, he's, his, he's broken. His brain broke. He's absolutely insane until a day comes where all of a sudden the Lord redeems David and they set him in as king in rightful place. And what does David do? But he restores worship. He restores the tabernacle, and he restores even the the country where he's the the first one to come in to to actually be a king and a priest. 
One that says not only do we care about government and rule and law and order, but we also care about the church. We care about the presence of God. And, and he sets everything up for the formation of his son to come and actually build the temple. It's amazing to see that each and every individual story in the Bible has this storyline. Now, maybe I just ruined all the stories for you. <laughs> now you're going to read it and be like, really? I know what's going to happen, right? Like, I know it. But also, every movie that you watch has the same, same thing. So, you know, uh, you know, there's always a hero. And then everything is made perfect again until a sequel so they can make more money. But um, the reality is this is the story and the timeline of every story. This is Jesus' story. We celebrate the birth of Jesus. We celebrate him coming to earth. And then what do we do is we look at this and we see that he gave his life. In, in, for, for the sin of you and me, he gave his life and he died on a cross for you and me. He rose again to new life. He was the redeemer. That was, that's who he was. And then after he rose to new life, what did he do? He made a way for us to be restored to relationship, to restored to a family. And then he says, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you that I will come back and have a final restoration of now a home. And it's beautiful to see that this is Jesus' story. Some people I've talked to uh, that have said, hey, listen, like, I know you guys talk about the gospel all the time, but that's like one little spot that Jesus mentioned the gospel. The reality is, is that the gospel is in every story in the Bible. This is the gospel. The gospel is that God created you with purpose and design. Maybe you've been told your entire life that you just came into existence, but we know that God created each and every person with a purpose and with a design. You were created with, 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 to, to actually glorify him, to honor him, and to have a calling and to be able to function in this way. But you know what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us can see the effects of sin in, a lot, in our life, in the lives of those around us, and every one of us has fallen. And you know what we need? Is we need someone to redeem us, to save us, and that person is Jesus. This is the gospel. And when he redeems us and he saves us, he does this. He restores us to right relationship with God. He places us and restores us to a family called his church. And then he says, I will go and I will come back and I will prepare a final home for you. You know, the gospel is in every single person's story. And the gospel is the story of the Bible. It's not one mention. It's the entire theme of the book. There's a beauty to how it is actually built and created when you step back and you realize what he's trying to say for the whole thing, he's saying for absolutely every individual thing. This is also your story. When we look at this in our own lives, hey, we're, there, there's a moment where it's like maybe you heard a, a call of the Lord. Maybe the Lord is even giving you peace. I know what I'm called to do, and I feel like there's this purpose in my life, and I want to live it. But the one thing holding you back is the fact that we live in a fallen, dark world. And so I know in my own life, I look at this, I felt like, I felt like the call of the Lord on my life when I, was, when I was 13. I felt like the Lord spoke to me and, and gave me purpose and gave me, gave me like this, this drive. And then from that, that moment on for the next who knows how many years, I just felt like there was this, this effect of sin in my life. And I could never do what I wanted. I could never do what I felt like I was called to do. And over and over and over again, it's like you step up to say, okay, God, I'm going to step into my calling. And then it feels like the, the rug's ripped out from underneath you and everything falls apart and nothing comes together nothing works and you send a, spend a season of your life just going God why you called me to this but I can never get to there yeah. and then there comes a moment in our life where we step back and we realize we can't do it on our own your calling wasn't for you alone to fulfill your calling is something that the Lord wants to do in you. Your purpose is something the Lord wants to do in and through you. And you know what it requires? It requires Jesus. It requires someone outside of you. If you haven't got the point yet, you can't save yourself. Every single one of us in our story, the only reason that we are saved is because of what Jesus has done for us. This is the whole point and the purpose. And when you jump in and you receive, you receive that gift and you say, yes, Jesus, I receive the gift of salvation, that's the moment where he restores right relationship, where all of a sudden you, you don't wake up in the morning going, I feel like God hates me. You wake up in the morning going, why do you love me? There's something that changes. You're restored to a right relationship with your creator. And he restores you to a family. We find his family, his church, is absolutely amazing and a part of what he is doing here on planet earth. And you know what? There is a day in which I cannot wait to go to a final home. 
because he goes to prepare a place and there will be a final restoration and a final moment when, when we finish at this life and we get to move into the next one with something prepared. This is your story and this is my story. Where are you in the story? Are you living, are you living the, the effects of the fall and sin? And you look at your life and say, everything in my life is falling apart, like it's just disintegrated. Or are you at a place that says, okay, I realize I can't do this on my own. There's only one person. There's only one thing that can save me, and that's Jesus. Maybe you're at a place where you've cried out to him, and he has saved you. Now you wake up in the morning and say, I'm right. It's right in my heart. It's right in my soul. And I can't wait to see this restoration of relationship, restoration of finding a church and a home and a family. And I cannot wait for what God desires to do in the future. You know, I ask my kids this question all the time. So we'll be driving in a car, sitting at home. You know, we talk about different things. Or the kids listen to mom and dad talk about different things. You know, something happens in our world or something happens in our state or whatever, our community. And they can hear mom and dad talking not arguing. Sometimes they're like, you guys are arguing. No, we're both just getting very heated about whatever we're talking about. You know, like, <laughs> we're not mad at each other. We're both mad at something else. So, uh, and the kids would watch you. Your kids watch you. And they can see that we're passionate about certain things and angry about certain things. And, you know, we live in a world in which everything doesn't just always go our way. And I know we, you know, I ask the kids this question. When they see us kind of going through one of these big life issues, right, something happens in our state, or even recently we've been praying about friends that we have that live in Ukraine. We're praying for them, praying for what they're doing and, and giving towards them, doing what we can, and, and we pray with our kids. Let's pray together. Let's ask the Lord that he would be the protection over them. I always ask my kids this question because the kids are trying to find a box to put it in, and I say this, you know, we talk about the issue. What is the issue with what we're talking about? So maybe it's a state thing. You know, as much as I want to say they're talking, you say, hey, kids, what's the issue? And they would say, well, it's, it's our governor. Like, Okay, I get that. You, can, you heard what we were talking about. That's great. Or, or maybe it's war. Or maybe it's the fact that something fell apart. Or, or whatever it is. But I always ask the kids this question. What is the problem? And the problem is always the same. Sin. Like no matter what it is, no matter what we're looking to, what we're trying to put blame on, or we, we love to put someone, we love to put a face so that we can blame that person. That's what we want to do. Oh, it's this fault. It's our government's fault. It's our, our school's fault. Oh, it's the teacher's fault. Oh, it's this fault. Oh, it's that fault. The reality is we want faces to put our problem on, but when we step back and we look at the overall theme of the Bible, we look at the theme of our life and what God is doing in us, what is the problem? It's sin. And what's the solution? Jesus. So I don't care what the problem is. I want to help my kids understand is that it doesn't have a name or a face. The problem is sin. And Jesus came to fix that problem, and he's the one who restores us. He's the one that redeems us. He's the one that saves us. And I'm hoping someday when my kids have a, an aha moment or a click moment where they step back and they look at the Bible from the big picture, that they'll be able to see it in their life and then say, that's what dad was saying, is that we have a problem, and it's sin, but there's a solution, and it's Jesus. And so we need to be able to present that, not just to our kids, but also for our own lives and our own self. In your life, no matter what you are going through, whether it's financial, relational, marital, like, you know, business-wise, health-wise, you look at this, you can say there is a problem, and the problem is sin, and there is a solution for all of it. And the solution is Jesus. He came to save you and to redeem you and to make things right. This is not only our story. And everybody else's story, it's the story of the Bible. For thousands of years, the Lord is reminding you, I have a promise, and I will fulfill my promise. Second part that I just want to wrap up with today is, is this idea of who's who. Now, I don't know if you've ever shown, you've been at a hotel, maybe you're traveling or you're at a park or something, and you see a group of people that are all together. Now, they don't have matching t-shirts, so you don't know if they're a sports team and, uh, you know, or a chess club, but you look at them and you're thinking to yourself, what do they all have in common? Like we did this recently, Rachel and I were traveling and, and there was this group of ladies, young and old, but like there was nothing that we could see that would like pull them together. We're trying to figure it out. Like what in the world is it? And you know, my best guess is it was a chess club, a ladies only chess club. And, uh, and we're like, well, what pulls them all together? Like why are they all together? That's the question I always have. You know what? When I look at the Bible, I ask the question, like there's a lot of people and a lot of stories in here. How come they got to be in here? You know, I, you know, you read some of these questions, you're thinking, like, you didn't deserve to be in this book. <laughs> you know, you gotta, like, and even short mentions of someone, you're like, and this person was blah, 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 and you're thinking, why? Why do they get mentioned? How come they showed up at the party? 
I used to actually believe when I was young that the Bible was the history of the world from creation uh, all the way through Jesus and beyond. Like this, this is the entire history. All of the world is in these, in these small pages. But come to find out, it's actually not the history of the world. It's the, it's the very um, well-kept Ancestry.com profile of one family. That's what it is. And when we look at the Bible, it starts in creation, but it follows the lineage of one family. What's amazing is this. It starts with Adam, and it gives the exact lineage all the way down to Jesus. Do you know that Jesus was a direct descendant of Adam? That's why he's referred to as the second Adam. He's the one that got it right when Adam got it wrong. And what's beautiful, when you see this, uh, it's even laid out in this, in this way uh, in the Bible. In the book of Genesis, if you throw it out there, Genesis 1 to 10 is really the history of the earth, Adam to Noah. And so it's the whole earth, actually, And when you look at it. And then all of a sudden in Genesis 11, if you write this down or take a picture of this and go look at Genesis 11 this week, you're going to find Genesis 11 now gives the, the lineage from Noah all the way to Abraham. That's it. Like, here you go. And it just lists, Noah had this son, and this son had this son, and this son had this son. And it's really obviously intriguing as you read it. You're like, you know. And, and, and then, awesome, sweet to Abraham. Sounds great. And then you hear all these stories about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Well, Matthew chapter 1, when you open it up and look at Matthew, Matthew gives the lineage from Abraham all the way to Jesus. So when Jesus shows up on the scene, I, I just totally love this. He is the direct descendant of Adam. And he came to fix what Adam broke. And there's a beauty in this book. It is so well put together. I'm telling you, Ancestry.com like wishes they could beat this. Because it's so well put together. So who are the stories and the names and everybody listed in here? It's anyone that was on that lineage. Now, sure, there was a lot of other people that existed in the earth, but they weren't actually in this lineage. And so the story that's being told is the story from creation to the mess up in the fall, all the way to restoration with Jesus. It's beautiful to see how it's all laid out. Now, one thing I love is, is that, that is this isn't the entire world history, but there's other world history that also that, that brings, you know, that, that kind of goes off and shoots off of the Bible. And um, Noah had three boys. And what you find is that the time of Noah was important because that was a flood. And the people who made it through that flood was Noah, Ab- uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. And so it was like a restart of civilization. So from that restart of civilization, actually all of humanity can trace your roots back to Noah. Now, this Bible is only the history of his son, Shem. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is the history of Shem. And if you look at this, this is the history. They stayed in the Middle East. These are, this is where the, the Abraham come from and the Israelite people and the Jewish people. All of this is just the history of Shem. But yet Noah had two other boys, Ham and Japheth. What's cool is that when you study history outside of the Bible, and, and it, it basically, you know, it, 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 uh, it also confirms what we read in the Bible, is that Ham, he went south and he went to Africa and, and started populating Africa and then moved over to Asia. And he lived most of his life in Asia. Now, if you study Asian history and Asian culture, what you'll find is that, is that before the dynasties, there was a list of what they would call the Eternals. That where, you know, when you look at, the, uh, at Asian history, the Eternals. Well, the Eternal that you see that they would trace all of Asian history back to is a man named Loham. And his father's name was Noah. And Loham lived several lifetimes. In fact, the Bible even says that he lived over 400 years past the flood. He lived several lifetimes, and he was eternal. doesn't mean he lived forever immortal. He was an eternal and lived several lifetimes. And if you study the history of the Chinese culture, what you're going to find is they have a great history of the flood. They have a history of Noah. They have a history of Ham. And they have an incredible history. In fact, Loham was the one who taught him how to, how to metalwork, taught them how to build, and taught them how to build society and rebuilt the society and set it up for the dynasties. This is, a, this, this is like beautiful Chinese culture. Now, from there, they traveled over to what we would know as Alaska. So Alaskan natives would be a part of, of Ham. And then on the east side of the United States, which didn't exist, uh, but the east side of the United States, well, it, the land existed, but it wasn't the United States. <laughs> <clears throat> if you don't know that, then you need to, we need to start over on history, okay? So all the way on the east side and down into South America. West side, thank you. On the west side. See, somebody's got this. On the west side in South America, 
Then what you find is Japheth left and went east. So anyone that you would see European, oh, we're, 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 uh, you know, we're German, or uh, everybody you know, would say, oh, we're Irish. I'm, you know, I'm sure 98% of us are Irish. We all say we're Irish. So we're Irish, right? And anyone there, right, is, is a son of Japheth. I would be a son of Japheth. And then they traveled over through the east side now of the United States. And those two tribes, Japheth and Ham, actually met years later in, in South America. Not those two people, but their, their descendants met. And that's where you have the Aztecs and the Mayans that then connected, and all of South America is a mixture of both. And it's crazy to see is that now, although this only follows the line of Shem, there is a world history that we can follow and we can see exactly what happened to each one of them and where it all went. There's a beautiful lineage and history in the Bible, but there's also an incredible story when we see it of exactly what God is doing. What, what do we see in all of this? We see a beautiful creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And what we, what, what's amazing is that all the way to Jesus the Redeemer. Now, the New Testament sets up the church, which is the family of God, and then we have the final return in the final two chapters. This is the lineage. So who gets to be in the Bible? Anyone who's a part of the lineage of Shem. The, the people of God. And when Jesus came, I love it. He says, now it's Jew and Gentile. Everyone now has opportunity to be a part of the family of God. It's when he reunited all three of the brothers and their families was through Jesus. Jesus is the key and pivotal person in all history, in all humanity, in this entire book, and in our lives. Worship team, would you come down? Um, Adam and Eve sinned. And our world went into a, a fall, a downhill spiral, until Jesus showed up on this planet. And what I love about the Bible is that there's an overall theme of what God is doing. He said, listen, I created it right, and sin ruined it. I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to restore it. And not only does he do that in the overall theme of the word, but he has thousands of years of stories of the people in which he walked through the exact same process. And you and I are in the exact same journey as everyone through all of history and all of humanity. And I love the Bible in that it's proof, thousands of years of proof of God's promise for you and for me. God can be trusted. He can be trusted throughout all of history. He can be trusted in every story. And he can be trusted in your story. And when you ask the Lord, you cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to save me. Would you be my savior? There's this beautiful restoration in each and every one of our lives that starts with him making our relationship right with him, that moves to him restoring us to a family, which is the family of God. And then we long for the day in which we have a final home and can be restored. What part of the story are you in? Maybe you're experiencing like the, the, the fall and you think everything in my life is completely broken. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried, but there's nothing that I can seem to do that is fixing my brokenness. Well, the point is you can't fix it. That you and I both need a savior. We need Jesus to heal the things in us that we can't fix ourselves. We actually need him in our everyday life to say, would you, would you come and would you, would you actually redeem me? Would you save me? Would you make it right so that in the morning you don't wake up and think, oh my word, what am I done? And I'm so, I, I don't know what to hold on to and I don't know how to do this day and I'm anxious and I'm fearful. But to actually wake up and to say, God, thank you today that although I can't make it, you can be my savior. Thank you that even though I'm not good enough, you're good enough for me. Thank you that, that even when I know I can't make this bill or I can't make this thing happen, that, that you actually are the one that will sustain me and heal me and restore me to relationship with you, to a family, and to a future home. Each one of us is in a different part of the story, but we're all on the same journey. And I want to invite you in to that journey. Maybe you've never heard about it. Maybe you've never seen the Bible in this perspective. You just thought it was a bunch of stories about crazy people and rules and laws. But I want to let you know today that there is a story that God is trying to not just tell. He's actually trying to invite you into. And each and every one of us gets the opportunity. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, which means he's the one who came to save you. He died for, for your sins on the cross. It says that you will be saved. And the moment you're saved, he starts this life process, this light process 
each inside every one of us. I want to pray. Maybe you bow your heads for a moment. Maybe you've never said yes to the Lord. Maybe you never asked him. Maybe you're still doing it in your own strength, trying to accomplish it so you can be proud of it. But to admit that we are sinners and to ask for help from Jesus is the only way for you to be fixed and healed. So I want to pray. And I want to invite you to pray with me. Maybe you prayed this, this is your first time ever praying this prayer. Or maybe it's the, you've been praying it for years. I want to pray this together as a church. Admit that we are fallen and that we need Jesus. So would you repeat after me, Jesus, thank you for coming to earth to save me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and for raising to new life so that I now can have life. I receive your gift this morning. In Jesus' name.